Good evening, my name is Tim Gibbs, Executive Director of the Delaware Academy of Medicine and the Delaware Public Health Association. Welcome to the next session of Delaware MiniMed. Uh, it turns out that our speaker for this evening, Dr. Gretchen McKay, was detained. And so this evening, we're gonna hear from our own Dr. Keith Smith, uh, who's gonna do uh, so a talk about stroke. And uh, without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Kate. And Kate, if you could uh, tell the audience a little bit about you and then the mic is yours. Uh, sure. So, hi, all. Um, oh, that's not the one that I want. All right, I'm going to stop sharing that. Um, I am the program manager at the Delaware Academy of Medicine, and that means that any program that we have, I have a hand in it. Um, um, so, so my job is as program manager is to just make sure all of our programs are working well, but it also means that um, I get to learn about topics and, and give presentations on topics. And one of the programs that I manage is um, we have a stroke support group. And so I basically, I do the tech support for that because I've never had a stroke, but um, I do also give them presentations on, on what type of you know, different, different types of stroke and, and different things about stroke. And so this is actually a presentation that I prepared for um, last month's stroke support group that never actually got given. And now I'm going to be giving it next month. So um, you guys get the joy of hearing this from me before they do. So um, I'm going to talk to you today about the worldwide burden of stroke. Um, so there's a couple of definitions that you need to know about stroke before you can kind of understand stroke. So if you think of stroke, you need to think of it like a brain attack. Um, you've heard of a heart attack where the coronary arteries either get blocked or there's um, a breakage in a coronary artery and that leads to a heart, a heart attack. Well, the a brain attack, if we think the stroke is a brain attack, is that the arteries leading to the brain, something goes wrong. And you can have two types of stroke. There's an ischemic stroke, which means that the blood supply is blocked to the part of the brain. And there's a hemorrhagic stroke, which means that there's the blood vessel supplying the part of the brain bursts. Think of it like um, a water balloon that gets too full and then all of a sudden it bursts. It does that, except unfortunately it does that with blood and um, that's not good for anybody. So the way that we talk about how stroke affects people in public health is we talk about a couple of, of interesting terms. The first one is years of life lost. So we look at how many people died due to this thing, in this case stroke, multiply that by the standard life expectancy at their age of death in years. So if you were 75, then your life expectancy is probably going to be um, not much. I think the life expectancy right now is 80 something. So how many people died at the age of 75? Um, times, say, five. Um, however, if you have a stroke at a younger age, your years of life loss is going to go up because you're going to be a younger age, so you have a higher life expectancy. The other thing that we look at is years lost to disability. So this means, you know, you didn't die, but you had a stroke, and now we um, multiply how many people survived a stroke, multiply that by a weight, we give it a weight depending on how much of a disability is there, and then the average duration until remission or death. And so since there's no real remission from stroke, um, it's kind of with stroke in particular, we look at life expectancy again. And then you have what's called a disability adjusted life year, which is one year, one daily is one year of healthy life lost. So one daily you take um, years of life lost and you add that to years lost to disability and you get your dailies. So this is not something that we do individually. This is something that we do across a population and we get what's called the burden of disease. So the burden of disease measures the gap between the current health status, so where we are now, how many people are having strokes now, and the ideal health situation, which is the one where nobody has any strokes and everybody lives to 120 years old and are happy and free of disease and everybody's great, okay? So those are the things that you kind of need to know. And then we're gonna look at stroke. So let's start at home and look in the United States. So in 2018, 
Um, 3.1% of the United States citizens had a stroke. That's 7.8 million adults who have ever had a stroke in their life. And again, in 2018, 2.2 million people were diagnosed with having had a stroke, either in their primary care office visit or in an ER. So the 2.2 million in an office visit, and then almost 500,000 people um, based on ER visits. In 2019, the data showed that there were over 150,000 people who died due to stroke, which translates down when we when we say, you know, deaths per year, we look at it um, as a number per 100,000. Because again, we're not looking at this as, you know, yes, you had a stroke, you had a stroke, you had a stroke. But um, we look at it over a population. So we look at it at 45.7 deaths per 100,000 population. And stroke in 2019 was the number five cause of death. So this is what it looks like in the United States. And it's pretty interesting. Um, if you look, we call these states that have outlines. Unfortunately, I did not come up with the name, but we call it the stroke belt because for a multitude of reasons, these states, these Southern states, have a lot of folks who have had a stroke and have either died from the stroke or uh, survived the stroke, but continue to be affected by the stroke. Um, and then if you look at this, we can see stroke mortality by state. So the darker is the worse, um, but no, I lied, the, the darker is better. So we, we like Arizona, we like New England, um, and the lighter it is, um, the higher the death rate which I don't know why they did it backwards because I would have done it the other way, but whatever. The leading causes of death in the United States, um, we have number one is cancer, number two is heart disease, number three is accidents, number four is stroke, and that's in 2019. And stroke usually sits about at three to four um, in the United States. In Delaware, and this is as of 2017, uh, data that I found for 2017, this is the age-adjusted death rate for the leading causes of death. And you can see here's stroke number four in Delaware. So in Delaware, our number is 46.2. It's a little bit higher than the US at 37.6, um, but it is number four in Delaware as well. So if we look now towards the world and see kind of where the United States um, is in the grand scheme of things, um, according to the World Health Association, IHD, which is ischemic heart disease and stroke, have been the leading causes of death in the last 15 years, and approximately 80% of those are preventable. Um, IHD accounts for 16% of death and stroke accounts for 11% of death. And stroke is here in number two, the dark blue circle is uh, the numbers from 2019 and the um, white circle, if you will, is the numbers from 2020. So you can see how each of these things has changed over the years. So there's my arrow, it's kind of off a little bit, but that's where the stroke hits. Now, if we break these leading causes of death down into um, different income levels, we see that in the high income countries, stroke is number three. So that's like the United States, stroke is number three, number three, number four. Um, high income countries, this is where stroke is. In the upper to middle income countries, stroke is number two. And again, this is information as of 2019, so it could have you know, changed to three, but it's still up there. So we see in high and high to middle income countries, um, we see more that non-communicable diseases, so not infections, not anything like that, this is something that you, know, you have some kind of chronic disease, they become the leading cause of death. So we have ischemic heart disease, we have stroke, um, we have dementias, uh, COPD being the leading causes of death. But then when we get to um, lower middle income countries, stroke is still number two, but we have neonatal conditions as number three. So babies have issues and they die as a number three leading cause of death. Or we have number five, which is lower respiratory conditions. And in the lower income countries, stroke is down at number four because coming before it is neonatal conditions and lower respiratory infections. So now we see that because the countries are poorer, um, the, um, they kind of take over, the communicable diseases take over as more of a leading cause of death than stroke, which is kind of interesting. Um, 
So then we look at the global burden of disease, which means what is stroke doing around the world, right? So incident or new stroke, somebody getting a stroke for the first time, 11.9 million people will have a new stroke. And this is a 2020 report, so it's probably using 2019 or 2018 data. Prevalent stroke, meaning you had a stroke and then you survived, 104.2 million people. Fatal stroke, you had a stroke and you didn't survive, 6.2 million. And then the stroke-related um, disability, the stroke-related dailies, the disability-adjusted life years, um, 132.1 million. Now, all of those things went down from 1990 to 2017, which is great, except the absolute number of those things have, all, have gone up. So in developing countries, we see um, incident stroke rates at 80%, uh, prevalence strokes at 77%, deaths at 87%, and uh, disability adjusted life years at 89%. So there is an increase in stroke burden. So all of the, the numbers went down, but because the prevalence strokes went up and the incident strokes went up, we have more people who have had a stroke and survived. And so that's why the burden has gone up. We've figured out how to keep people alive, which is awesome. Um, but now we have to figure out how to help them, you know, live the rest of their life having had a stroke. Um, so this chart is the incidence in Europe and it's, it's kind of a, a a uh, weird looking chart, so bear with me. It's it's not very clear, which I apologize, but if it, I left it the size it was, you wouldn't be able to see anything. So the black and red dotted line is what we've seen so far, and that's up to about uh, 2015. So this is like data that we've already seen, that one we know. And then the bits that branch off are the different um, possibilities of what might happen between 2015 and 2047. So if, so let's look at the incidence rate. So the incidence rate is, you know, anybody that had a stroke, right? Um, that number on the, on the top left quarter went up because when they looked at this data, it was trending in an upward direction. The blue line is pessimistic. So they're looking at a 1% rate increase per year. So if that number, that baseline number increased by 1%, that would be the blue line. Um, the pessimistic, uh, the optimistic line is the green line. So if that rate decreased by 1% per year, that would be where it is. And then um, the red dotted line is a model with 95% um, accuracy that that's where they think the stroke will stay. So those are options. We don't know which ones are going to happen yet, um, but that's what they're thinking. So we would really like the red line to, to stay, basically. Prevalence is the number of people who have had a stroke and survived. Um, and Tim, you're not doing your job. There are people in the waiting room. You need to let them in. Hint, hint. Um, so prevalence is- I need to be co-host. Oh. Oh. oh, okay. Hang on, Paul. I don't know how to do that without sharing my screen. Hang on. Hang on. Let's just do that. You should have been co-host. You could start it, couldn't you? We'll, uh, we'll keep this part out of the <laughs> video for anybody who watches. Uh, Tim. Sorry, folks. Technology happens. All right. I'm just going to make you the host. Okay. All right. Cool. Thank you. You're welcome. All right. As we were. So again, prevalence, we kind of, in this case, the prevalence, we want the optimistic um, trend line rather than the model trend line rather than the baseline trend line and much rather than the pessimistic trend line because again remember prevalence is somebody who's had a stroke and survived so the model says we're going to have a whole lot more people who have had a stroke and survived um the optimistic is that it will start to decrease at a rate of one percent per year which we would prefer um deaths occurring uh, due to stroke so this is the upper right quadrant um the baseline was going up at the time. The pessimistic line is going up a lot. Um, the optimistic line is 
still going up, but the model line is going slightly down, which we like. And the same for uh, the disability adjusted life years. We, we, want to, we want that red line to be true. We want the model to be right. So this is a map, and this is from 2018, that's looking at the global lifetime risk of having a stroke, a stroke, any stroke. Um, so as you can see, the lower risk areas are Africa, India, um, South America, and then uh, Central America, and then the ones that kind of look white but are really blue, on my computer they look very white, um, are somewhere less than 25%. Um, yellow is starting to get up there. The United States is in 23 to 29%. You see China and Mongolia are kind of high. Um, so this is your global lifetime risk of having a stroke. Now, why? There are risk factors to having a stroke. Some of them are modifiable and some of them are behavioral. So let's talk about the modifiable ones. Um, the biggest modifiable risk factor for stroke is high blood pressure. So Around 1.13 billion people around the world have high blood pressure. It's also called hypertension. So if you hear your doctor say you have hypertension, that means that you have high blood pressure. Um, a high blood pressure reading means, you know, it might be up once or twice. Hypertension means it's consistently up. So we want to make sure that um, your blood pressure is low. And if you do have high blood pressure, you want to make sure that you're controlling it. So in men, the prevalence of having high blood pressure, hypertension is around 24%, which means a quarter of you men are likely to have high blood pressure. And over 50% of the people who have high blood pressure, who have hypertension, don't actually know that they have it, which is why it's so important to go and visit your primary care physician so that they can do, you know, yearly checkups and make sure that everything's under control. The prevalence of hypertension in women is around 20%. Um, and in patients over the age of 60, that prevalence increases to 60%. Doesn't matter if you're a man or a woman. So over half of patients over the age of 60 have some form of high blood pressure. And that leads to 27,397 deaths per day around the world, which is a lot, especially because it's preventable. So if you look at high blood pressure around the world, you see 23% of people living in the Americas have high blood pressure. 37% in Africa, 29% in Europe and Asia, 30% um, in Eastern Mediterranean, 25% in Southeast Asia, and 26% in the Western Pacific. So it's not something that's only seen in the United States. It's not something that's only seen in first world countries. It's seen everywhere um, and people have it. Another modifiable risk factor is obesity. So this data is from 2016. Um, Obesity is defined as having a body mass index equal to or greater than 30. Now, using body mass index to um, test for obesity has kind of gone out of, of style, if you will, um, but there are ways to test a body mass index or uh, uh, obesity that does not include your body mass index, but that's a pretty like quick and dirty way of doing it. Um, so it's a good quick check for you, but if you want to do it properly, you go into the doctor, they'll take calipers and, and measure and that kind of thing. But um, this shows that the United States is really high. So we have over 40% of our population is obese, which is not great. Um, but we are not alone. Um, Saudi Arabia also has very high blood pressure. I don't know why. I haven't asked anybody in Saudi Arabia why they have obesity, but they do. Uh, but we're followed by Canada and Australia and Europe. And so, you know, it's not just us, but... The fact that over 40% of us have obesity is something that, you know, you need to think about, especially if you're at risk for stroke, because we'll get to that. Other risk factors include diabetes and chronic kidney disease. So these are medical conditions, and I'm not saying that, you know, if you have diabetes, you're more likely to have a stroke if it's not controlled. There are those people that have diabetes, and it's perfectly controlled and they're perfectly fine. They're not at any more risk than anybody else. But if you don't control your diabetes, that's when it increases the risk. Same with chronic kidney disease. There are plenty of people out there with chronic kidney disease and it's under control or as under control as it can be. They're at lower risk. It's the people that have all these things and they are uncontrolled and that's what makes them higher risk. 
So those were the modifiable risk factors. Let's talk about the behavioral risk factors, okay? Um, smoking, this is huge, okay? Uh, death rate from smoking in 2017, in this, you can see, um, what is that, Greenland? Likes to smoke, apparently, didn't know that. Um, Asia, certain countries in Africa. Um, the, the more you smoke, the more likely you are to um, have a stroke. It's just, that's the way it is. So if, if anybody smokes out there in, in Zoom land, please stop now. That is my advice to you. If you take nothing else away from this presentation, take that away. Please stop smoking. Um, the sedentary lifestyle made even more interesting during COVID when we were all working from home in our couches. Um, the most inactive country, go figure, in, um, I think this was 2016, was Kuwait. Uh, the most active country was Uganda, go figure. Um, but you can see that Brazil, uh, Kuwait, Saudi Arabia had very high levels of sedentary lifestyle. So the more you get out and walk, the more you, you know, park further away, the more you take the stairs, um, all of that's going to cut down on your risk. Air pollution, this is really neat, and you can go to this website and find the air pollution um, in your area. I actually zoomed into Delaware the other day. It was pretty cool, but this was taken about a week ago, um, and air pollution can lead to stroke uh, because you're breathing in particulates and you're, um, you know, breathing in things that you're not supposed to be breathing in, and all of those things can lead to stroke. So, um, again, this is not necessarily modifiable because not everybody can do anything about the air that they're breathing in. Um, this one is modifiable in that we can make policies and we can try and live in places that have clean air, but it's not entirely up to us. The number one non-modifiable risk factor, however, is age. So this is the prevalence of stroke by age and sex, in this case, gender, men and women, um, in NHANES, which is um, a survey done in the United States. And you can see uh, as age goes up, your prevalence of stroke goes up uh, in men slightly more than women in this case. This is stroke admissions in England, in Wales and Northern Ireland. And you can see as age goes up, so does stroke. And in this case, women beat out the men. So there's no real, you know, women are more likely. It's just more that women are more likely to live longer than men. So therefore, at the age of 89, because it's more likely that women are alive, they are therefore more likely to have had a stroke at that age. And this is in South Korea. So again, we see high numbers in the 55, 65 age group. It goes down in 85. Why? Well, because there are fewer people in that age group. So the fewer people there are to have a stroke, the fewer people can be counted for that. This is stroke death rates by age for the world from 1990 to 2017. And this red line here is those over the age of 70. Every other line down here, the purple line is 50 to 69 years, the green line is all ages, the pink line is 15 to 49, the blue line is five to 14, um, as you age, your risk of stroke goes up. So if we talk about stroke survivors, um, the probability of death within a year after the first stroke is highest for white females um, over the age of 75. The probability of death within five years after the stroke, first stroke is still pretty much white females and um, white males over the age of 75. So again, we're talking age. Your global lifetime risk of stroke, so red line is just stroke in, in general. The blue line is ischemic stroke. That was the one where the blood doesn't get to the brain. And the hemorrhagic stroke is the one where it was like a balloon and a burst. Um, so your risk of stroke is pretty flat until you hit about 55, 60, and then it goes down. But I don't want you to look at this graph and say, well, Kate, you know, this is negating what you just told me. Because remember, there are fewer people in this age bracket. If you've had a stroke and you didn't survive, well, then your risk is gonna go down to zero because you're not gonna have another stroke. 
you're dead. Um, if you've had a stroke and survived, then um, your risk goes up. So it kind of vaguely makes up for that. But people are going to die as they age of things other than stroke. So the fewer people there are in that age bracket to count, the fewer people um, there are to have a risk of stroke. It's a very morbid topic that I'm talking about here. So stroke prevention, how do we prevent it? Things you can't control, air pollution, age, genetics. If you have a family history of stroke, there's nothing you can really do about that, um, except you can modify and control any risk factors that you have. So if you have high blood pressure, if you have diabetes, if you have hypercholesterolemia, control your blood pressure, control your glucose, make sure that you're um, controlling your sugar, you're watching the fat that you eat, eat a healthy diet. Every doctor you ever hear is going to say, eat a healthy diet full of fruits, vegetables, whole grain, lean meat, and fish. Restrict salt, sugar, and fat, alcohol in moderation. That's like the go-to. If you do that, your any diseases that you may or may not have risk is very much reduced. Physical, physical activity, 30 minutes every day, uh, don't smoke. And since this was a really fast presentation for something, I'm done already. <laughs> So I'm happy to take questions if you'd like to ask any. Uh, Dr. Smith, one of the questions that was asked were um, the stroke stats that you uh, displayed in the beginning, did they include mini strokes, uh, TIAs? I don't believe so. I think this was a full on, um, either it was either hemorrhagic or ischemic stroke that these were including. TIAs are tricky because while we can, um, diagnose them with a fair degree of certainty, it's never entirely sure. So these would be, you know, strokes that were diagnosed, um, like they saw the blood clot or they saw the aneurysm burst. Okay. Another question was, um, uh, what's the, um, and even I'm blanking on it now, what's the acronym for somebody having a stroke that has to do with face and motor control. Can you tell us fast. about that? Yes. So fast. The, first, the F is face. You're going to look for facial drooping. So what happens when you have, oh, I'll, I'll put this up too because I have it up. What happens when you have a stroke is um, the, the blood to your brain gets blocked. And a lot of people are like, well, how do I know I've had a stroke? And this is a good way of checking because if the blood to your brain is blocked on one side, say my right side, the blood is blocked, then I'll be able to see it on my left side. So what your brain does, it switches sides of your body. So if something's going on in your left hand side, then there's something wrong with the right part of your brain. So what you're looking for is differences in both of those sides. And if you think fast, this is the way you do it. So you're going to look at the face to see if either side is drooping. So like if I can smile like this, but this side is drooping, I can't, I haven't had a stroke, so I, you can't see it, but it's like, I'm smiling and this side is drooping, then you know there's, there might be a problem. Um, arm weakness. If you tell somebody, you know, put your arms out and one of them starts going down, then their arm is weak. If they're having problems speaking, if it's like slurry speech, um, if you notice one side of their mouth isn't moving the same, if maybe their tongue is protruding to one side or another. And then the other one is time. The faster we can take care of someone who has had a stroke, the more likely it is that they will be able to make a more complete recovery. All righty. Uh, is there a typical trajectory for people who have already had one stroke for instance, predictable intervals of time uh, to the next one, severity of increasing for the next one, opposite side of the brain next time, and so on. Nope. Nope. The funny thing about stroke is that um, we don't, we can kind of know if you might have one um, because maybe you have the, um, Maybe you have some of the risk factors. Maybe you have a family history. Maybe you have high blood pressure. Um, and so the, the chance of you having a stroke is kind of based on those risk factors. But if you've already had a stroke, A, it does make you more likely to have a second one. But that second one may have absolutely nothing to do with the first one. So if your first one 
um, was on the left-hand side of your brain and it affected your speech. Your second one could be on the right-hand side of your brain and affect your vision. We don't actually know. It all depends on which artery is either blocked or pops. And another question was, um, uh, if you feel that you're having a stroke, no one else has observed this. You just feel like something's very wrong. What should you do? Yeah, you should definitely always err on the side of checking it out. Um, if you feel off, um, you might not have like a full on stroke. You might be having a TIA, a transient ischemic attack. Um, and that might be enough of a sign that, you know, if you get to the hospital, they'll be able to monitor you and see what's going on. And they, then you, the time situation would be great because you'd already be in the hospital. The thing with time is that there are certain drugs that we can give. Um, TPA is one of them. It, it kind of breaks up any clots so that, you know, we can, we can push through if the issue is that you've had an ischemic stroke. The problem is if you've had a hemorrhagic stroke and we give you TPA, then you're going to keep bleeding, which is equally as bad. So um, that's why time is a factor. So either you're not bleeding into your brain enough or you're bleeding out of your brain too much. And so if you think something's off, like you're slurring your speech or, you know, some people have had a headache where they don't normally have headaches or, um, you know, your, your vision gets fuzzy or you get dizzy or, you know, you can't walk straight. Um, maybe you feel weakness in one side, then yeah, get yourself to the hospital, get yourself, even if you just go to your doctor or an urgent clinic, um, they can, they can start to, to look at what might be going on and, and get you where you need to be as quickly as possible. Can you tell us a little bit about um, trephining and brain bleeds and, and major pressure and, and what the process is to let the, to relieve that pressure? What was the first thing that you said? Trephining? Uh, trephining. You, you, sometimes you see it on like uh, the History Channel, old, old you know, uh, period movies where they actually cut a hole into the skull to, to relieve the pressure. Oh, okay. Yeah. Well, there are lots of, okay, so hmm, how do I explain this well? The skull can't move. The brain is a squishy little, um, think jello. The brain is jello inside your skull and the skull can't move. Jello is being fed by blood. The brain takes up 50% of your blood, 50% of the food that you eat goes directly to your brain to make sure that it's working properly. So, if the blood doesn't get there because you've had an ischemic stroke, the blood has been blocked, that means that the brain um, can't, can't work. I'll share my screen again um, and I'll show you the pictures because I find them cool so you guys can too. Um, so this is the ischemic brain. Can you see, um, I don't know if you can see what I'm pointing to, but um, so if you look at the, this is an MRI picture of the brain and on the ischemic side, the left side, you'll see that there's this big glob that's darker. So that's the brain that's dead. Um, it, it didn't get blood and so it died. And brain, it, your brain dies fairly quickly, unfortunately. Um, the hemorrhagic stroke is next to that on the right is all this white is blood in your brain. Not supposed to be there, okay? so. You can either have no blood in your head, bad, or too much blood in your head, also bad, because that blood has nowhere to, well, it does have places to go, but if there's too much blood in your head, then it's going to start pushing things away. So it's going to push the jello into the skull, which is bad, because then the brain could die from being pushed against the skull. Um, or it could die from, you know, being pushed against something else that it's not supposed to be pushed against. It could, you know, push against the bottom of your skull and mess up your balance. There are these, if you can see them, there's this big white glob in the hemorrhagic stroke MRI. There's a little, it kind of looks like a black tadpole next to it. And there are three little darker dots towards the bottom. Those are called sinuses. And in medicine, sinus is basically just a hole. And so your, your brain uh, drains the blood from the skull through these sinuses. Now, if there is something wrong with those sinuses or they're too closed um, and your brain can't 
drain the blood, that can lead to an issue. And that can also lead to a stroke because it's kind of like a hemorrhagic stroke where now all of a sudden there's all this blood in the brain. Um, the blood is pushing the brain aside and not letting it do what it needs to do. And so the brain dies that way. Um, so what they did back in history um, is that, and, and sometimes it will still happen today. Um, if you bumped your head, there's a chance that something's going to bleed. Now, normally you bang your head and you get a bruise fine, you get a bruise, no problem. But if you get a bruise, a bruise is just blood right underneath the skin. It pulls kind of where the, where the bang happens, it pulls and then your body gets rid of the pool of blood. If it happens between the inner part of your skull and there's a, um, a layer over the brain called dura mater. So if it happens between your skull and the dura mater, then that blood will push down on your brain. Um, let me see if I can find you a picture of these things. See, this is who we were supposed to have today. Aha, look at that. Yeah, this got through the school. <laughs> Don't tell me I'm doing things through the school. That's not good. All right, so let's look at this. I like it, geekymedics.com. Perfect, just like me. All right, yes, cookies, fine, bad uh, Pictures, pictures, pictures. Okay, so here's your hair, right? And then there's a fat pad, and then there's some connective tissue, and then there's the skull, and then there's dura matter. So this yellow, can you guys see what I'm pointing at, Tim? Yes. Okay, cool. So there's this yellow thing here, that's dura matter. The green thing here, is dura matter, but it's like dura matter on the brain side. So you have like the dura matter on the brain side and the dura matter on the skull side. So if a um, a hemorrhage or a bruise or you know pooling of blood were to start happening between the skull and the dura matter, then all this yellow and green would get pushed into the brain. Okay, and so that would act like a hemorrhagic stroke. Um, I think this blue thing, yeah, so this blue thing here is the sinus, which remember is just a hole, right? Um, then we have, um, there's, there's a bit called pia matter, and then there's subarachnoid space. So this is all within the, the meninges, okay? So you have the uh, dura matter parietal, because parietal meaning against the parietal bone, so this is against your skull. You have the dura mater visceral, which means against the brain. Um, you have subarachnoid space, which is under the arachna, and then you have pia mater, and then you have the brain. So if you have a bleed within any of these, it will push the brain, because the skull's not going anywhere, so it will push the into the brain, and that can lead to um, issues, stroke-like issues. If it's pushing into Wernicke's area, you might have trouble speaking or understanding speech. Or Broca's area, you might have trouble speaking or understand speech or reading and looking at things, all that kind of stuff. Um, and what surgeons do today, if, if um, intracerebral pressure is going up, is they drill a borehole, which is basically they take a, a drill, like a, a surgical drill, not a drill you have in your, you know, tool shed, um, but they put a little hole in your skull and they let that blood out. Um, and as gross as it sounds, it works. Like, <laughs> don't, I guess don't knock it till you try it. Don't mess with what works, that type of thing. Um, but that's why people drill into other people's heads. Alrighty. And I've said to everyone in the uh, chat since the, we didn't have the presentation we expected, and Dr. Smith flew through her presentation so quickly. If you have yeah, general I mean, questions. 31 slides. I mean, yeah. I don't know that I flew. If you, if you have general questions, by all means, drop them in the chat. So there's a question in the chat from Bruce. It says, have there been any recent advances in rehabilitation for people that have had strokes? Um, range of possible therapies, speech, occupational, cool technologies or games, et cetera, et cetera. So yes, there are. Um, the more we learn, the more we can work with what happened. And remember, depending on your stroke, 
will depend on what you need uh, to get back. So if you've had a little TIA, you might not need anything at all. If you've had a major stroke um, and it affected your dominant side, then you might need to relearn how to write. Um, you might need to relearn the alphabet and how to read. You might need to learn how to speak. Um, you might need to learn how to walk. There might be some uh, functions that you never get back. So there are several people in our stroke support group who they don't have the use of their hand anymore because um, it just, it, there was too much damage and they didn't get to it in enough time or, or something um, and they won't get it back. But they, yes, we use um, speech therapy we use occupational therapy. So occupational therapy is like learning how to do things again, like brushing your teeth or walking or writing and that type of thing. And physical therapy is, you know, if you need assistive devices, um, you need to relearn how to walk, you need to maybe have something to help you put on your shoes. All of that are, are things that, um, that can be done and that we have. And actually the University of Delaware has a really good physical therapy post-stroke program where they, you know, work with people. They have treadmills that, you know, you can stand on to practice walking. Um, they have robotics now that help people get back on their feet. Um, so yeah, there's, there's a lot of cool technologies. Um, I know that there are games. I don't know if they're cool games, but there are some games that work on like hand-eye coordination and that type of thing. So, um, yeah. All right. Uh, what's the difference between hemorrhagic stroke and an aneurysm? A hemorrhagic stroke is an aneurysm, but an aneurysm isn't necessarily a hemorrhagic stroke. So a hemorrhagic stroke is an aneurysm that happens in your brain. An aneurysm can happen anywhere. An aneurysm can happen anywhere that there's an artery. If an artery gets very weak at the wall, it can burst. So if it can burst near your lung, it can burst in your abdomen, but if it bursts in your brain, then it leads to a hemorrhagic stroke. All right. Would you say that the younger you are, the easier it is to recover and have a more successful rehabilitation from a stroke? Um, depending on the stroke, probably. So it depends on where the stroke hits and it depends on how young. Children and adolescent and infant brains are very malleable. So we'll see ridiculous things like kids will be having um, epilepsy and they will literally cut their brain in half and cut off what, so the way that your brain works is like the right half controls the left and the left half controls the right, but there is a spot where they communicate with each other. They'll cut that in children with epilepsy to stop the seizures. And the child will be fine because the brain will come up with other ways to wire itself. So the younger you are, the more likely it is that, you know, your connections haven't cemented yet. And so you're more likely to create new wiring and stuff like that. Um, the older you are, unfortunately for my friends who are my age and older, we're pretty set in our ways as far as brain goes. So it's really hard to teach your brain new tricks. So that's the problem with maybe not necessarily having as successful a rehabilitation. Like we have to teach our brain new tricks and you can only do it to a certain point once you get to a certain amount of your brain having, you know, wired itself. So our, our nails grow and our hair grows and our, our skin grows and, and sheds and whatnot. Does, does brain matter um, regenerate itself? Not to the degree that everything else does. Your neurons and your brain, um, they're, they're kind of it, which is why when we see like muscular dystrophy or any other kind of neurologic disease, we don't really know how to completely cure it because we don't grow new neurons like we do when we're in the womb. With, and that's part of the reason why the, the conversation about stem cells is so um, interesting because a stem cell is a cell, a, a, cell, a cell from which you can grow every cell in your body, right? So theoretically, we should be able to take a stem cell and grow a new brain. Well, then the question becomes, you know, well, when do we stop and, and who owns the brain and blah, 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 blah. Um, I'm not getting into the stem cell research, but the point is that once the brain has created its neurons, once the spinal cord has created its neurons, there's not a whole lot more uh, recreation. It's kind of what you see is what you've got. So if you've damaged that because you've had a stroke or some kind of head trauma, or you're paralyzed because you know you broke your back or something, 
your neurons don't regrow. All righty. Any other questions? So Stacy had a question in the chat. So even though the brain is damaged in certain areas, our brains have enough plasticity to learn new things in different areas of the brain. Yes, to a point. The younger you are, the more likely it is that you will learn it well, or you will retrain your brain well enough to pretty much be able to function without any observable deficit. Uh, but the older you are, the less likely that plasticity is still there. Um, and therefore, you might not be as, as good at coming back as a child would. Kate, what's the uh, relationship between migraines and stroke and, and the, those optic hallucinations that some people report? Um, I don't know, I'm not a neurologist, um, but the headaches are tricky because they, like stroke, can have many reasons for happening. You can have a headache because you're dehydrated. You can have a headache because you had too much water. You can have a headache because um, you haven't eaten. You can have a headache because you're around too much noise. And everybody's headaches are going to be different. There are some um, migraine headaches that they have like a halo, which means that the, the person who's getting these migraines can tell that it's coming on because it has um, things that happen beforehand. So a lot of times it's a halo of light. So like if you look at a light bulb or something, you'll see a halo around it or you'll hear a buzzing. Um, so we don't really know if there's a connection between them because a lot of people have migraines and they don't go on to have strokes. And a lot of people have migraines and they do go on to have strokes. And so we, there's no real, the only way to test that would be to take all of the people that have ever had a headache and follow them for the rest of their lives and see if they had a stroke and what kind of stroke that was. And then look at everything else that happened in their life to determine if there was any kind of correlation or causation, which that's way too much money for science. <laughs> So there's no real way to answer that question. All right, and there's a question from uh, Tanya. Is the medication that tells the brain that you are not in pain, and what, if any, is the outcome of that? Not quite sure. I'm not sure what you mean, Tanya. Do you maybe want to come off of mute? Let's see if I can find Tanya in the queue here. Tanya, where are you? There you go. Tanya, I've asked you to unmute if you'd like to ask your question directly. There you go. Go ahead, Tanya. Okay. Um, my question was more of when, like, um, let's say that you've had surgery. So you know that you're really going to be in pain. So is there, is the, the medication that they give you, is that something that kind of tells your brain that you are not in pain? And then, and then what is the outcome of that? Because your body is in pain, but your brain believes that you're not. So, so I think you act accordingly to what you believe. Is that making any sense? Yeah, yeah, I, I got you. I, I, I'm picking up what you're throwing down. So the answer to your first half of your question is that um, pain relieving medications that we give, um, there are receptors in your brain that will say, this hurts, right? So the way that a, um, it's kind of like a reflex, but let's say I cut my hand, all right? A nerve will go from my hand all the way up to my brain and it will send out a signal using hormones. Maybe it's adrenaline, maybe it's dopamine. You know, there, those are all those hormones. And one of those hormones will be released and it will go to a receptor in my brain. And so when hormone A hits receptor B, that means, ow, it hurts. So what a pain relieving medication does is it floods those receptors with things that are similar to the hormone so that the receptors get bombarded by the other thing and the, the pain doesn't compute. There's not, uh, the pain doesn't get to fit itself into any receptor. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay, so that's part one. Part two of your question. The interesting thing about the human body is that it hurts if I cut into your abdomen, 
or if you, you know, cut your arm, or um, if you're doing surgery and I have to like open up your chest or something to see your heart, that will hurt. It's yeah. only going to hurt until I get through the skin. Your muscles, your gut, they don't have any pain receptors in them. So the only reason that you're getting the pain receptors is because your skin hurts, all right? So even if I go in and I like take out your gallbladder, once I've sewn you back up again, I'm giving you pain medications for that spot where I went in to get it, but your gallbladder is not telling your body that it hurts. So yes, we have to be careful about how much pain medication you get. Because if, if you've broken your leg, that hurts too. Bones hurt too. Um, but if you've, if you've broken your leg and I've given you so much pain medication that you don't realize that it's broken, you're going to walk on it. You're going to make it worse. Um, we actually see that with patients who have so much adrenaline running in them, they, they've got so much adrenaline, they don't realize that they're hurt. Now the adrenaline has helped them to, I don't know, escape the burning building, but once they're out, they look down at their feet and they realize, oh, my feet are all burned at the bottom and I didn't even notice. Um, so yes, we have to be careful when we give you pain meds um, to make sure that we're not giving you too much, which is why if you have surgery, you know, first we make you go to sleep so that you're not, awake during surgery. And, but again, if you wake up during surgery, you probably won't feel it. It'll be scary as anything because, you know, you might wake up and be like, oh my God, I can see all these people in there. Doing this and this. But you won't be able to necessarily feel any pain. It's just weird. Um, but then, yeah, we'll, we'll have you on really heavy pain meds and then we wean you off of them in the hospital so that we can be sure that we've got a good uh, dose where you're manageable. And then when you go home, we give you like the Tylenol-3 and that type of thing. Great, a couple other <laughs> questions. Does having COVID-19 make you more at risk for a stroke? We don't know yet. Um, I don't think we have enough data. There, there are some people that say yes, and some people that say we don't have enough data yet. Um, so anecdotally, I would say some things might. So if you get COVID so bad that you have to be in the hospital, then you're not really moving around a lot. And we all know sedentariness increases your chance of stroke. Um, they're saying that some people who have had COVID will have some kind of cardiovascular issue afterwards. So if that issue is, uh, leads to high blood pressure, then yeah, your risk might for stroke might go up because you have the high blood pressure. We just... We don't have enough long-term data yet on COVID-19 for me to equivocally say yes or no. Um, it's going to be a, we have to wait and see, but maybe. Okay, another question. What are the major differences between stroke and Bell's palsy? So stroke is a brain attack. We don't know where it's going to hit in your brain. Bell's palsy is the paralysis of your facial nerve. So it, there's a nerve that comes out of your brain and it basically does this. There's one on each side and part goes up to your forehead, part goes up, goes to your chin and part goes to your uh, cheek. So if you get paralysis of this and Bell's palsy can happen because of, uh, it can happen because of stroke if, if that part of your brain was affected. Um, Bell's palsy, the facial nerve is a, cranial nerve, which is a little bit different than a brain, than your brain, but if, if the stroke has affected that area where the cranial nerve comes out, then it might be affected by the stroke. Um, but in general, it's uh, due to high stress or pinching the nerve or, you know, we worry about Bell's palsy if somebody has had some kind of a facial, facial laceration or um, something happened to their face. But yet, you'll see a facial droop there. So, you know, it's important to note if it is just Bell's palsy or if it is in fact stroke, which is why we do the arms and the speech and everything. 